few words maybe on the, the history of my group. So um, historically, we actually come from the different you know, side of uh, tip-based microscopy. We did tip-enhanced spectroscopy and microscopy on various samples such as cadmium selenide nanowires doing Raman and PL imaging. We did a lot of work on nanotubes, photocurrent mapping, Raman mapping, and more recently, we also try to play with the degree of anti-bunching in the system using uh, a tip, always in the connection of tip-enhanced spectroscopy. Um, since about one and a half years, we are now happy owners of a NEASPEC system, and, and today I want to talk about our first, say, uh, uh, experimental attempts. It's very much work in progress um, that I'm going to present you today. So the topic of the talk is um, novel organic solar cell materials. More specifically, we are looking at so-called non-fullerene acceptor organic solar cells. As the name implies, uh, these are solar cells that, that don't contain a fullerene, uh, but instead um, a molecule here is an electron acceptor, for instance, this type uh, Y6, that is mixed together with an electron donor, which is a polymer. Uh, why is this interesting? Well, I mean, in this case, both electron, the donor and acceptor contribute to the absorption spectrum, to light harvesting, in contrast to fullerene-based systems where the fullerene uh, barely absorbs in the visible. Um, so the two together form a so-called bulk heterojunction solar cell. Uh, energetically, um, people believe that in order to have electron transfer, there's nearly no thermodynamic driving force needed. And uh, in this configuration, they achieve amazingly high power conversion efficiencies on the order of 16%. Um, the power conversion efficiencies, of course, depend on the absorption spectra, energy level alignment, uh, and more specifically also in molecular stacking, the phase separation and the resulting film morphology. You see here a cover of a journal that kind of tries to illustrate this complex interplay. Um, the question we want to address here is, of course, is there domain formation and what are the sizes of these domains? And for this, we would like to use uh, our NEASPEC system. Uh, in the literature, there are plenty of reports on, in this case again, fullerene containing samples where people indeed succeeded in using a scattering SNOM to identify domains in these films con containing either uh, the donor or the acceptor. Uh, there are also some results on non-fullerene acceptors. This is what you see here. This is work uh, with uh, uh, photo-induced force microscopy uh, where people probed here the absorption of, that's the peak of the uh, Y6 uh, acceptor in space versus the uh, contribution, no, sorry, I did wrong. The red peak is the, the polymer. The green peak is from the uh, acceptor, the small molecule that you see here in green. And there is some spatial contrast, but it's not really complementary in terms of having distinct areas where you either have the donor or the acceptor. Okay. So now we try to address this problem, as I said, using our new NEASNOM that is coming in a kind of standard configuration using a broadband IR laser source for nano FTR, and on the other side, we have different laser sources for doing PS head imaging. Now, <clears throat> if you look at uh, such a non fullerene acceptor uh, film, again, this is a sample that is called PTQ10Y6. What you typically see is a rather smooth topography. Maybe you cannot see the number, it's five nanometers. Uh, maximum amplitude variation on a 2 by 2 micron scan. Um, this is a zoom in. Here you see the mechanical phase that shows a distinct contrast on a length scale of 20, 30 nanometers, suggesting that there are indeed different components. Uh, the optical amplitude image, for instance, at the second harmonic, uh, shows you also a contrast, but this is kind of the inverse of the topography, telling us that there is no clear material contrast, but more a uh, topography-related contrast that is uh, reflecting uh, the local film thickness. Typical film thickness is here on the order of 100 nanometers. Samples are on silicon. Okay, so now let's do uh, spectroscopy. We first took the reference spectra from the individual donor and the acceptor. This is what you see here in red and in blue. Uh, and then we looked at the nano-FTR spectrum of the uh, blend. The red is the uh, acceptor that, of course, dominates this IR response. See here the peaks clearly coming up. So that's the Y6. 
uh, the donor here, the spectra are normalized, has a much smaller contribution that leads to this additional PQ on the side such that we can clearly say, yes, we can see both donor and acceptor in this nano after our spectrum, but they are clearly dominated, again, by this uh, Y6 acceptor contribution. That also makes it difficult to distinguish the individual contributions. So what you see here are consecutively recorded uh, nano FTR spectra in spatial steps of 20 nanometer, already showing uh, that there are, are not really large if any, uh, spatial variations. You can also see that here we made a line scan, 800 nanometers. Uh, here you have the contribution of the Y6, for instance, also here and here, that dominates. The PTQ10 donor renders this signal contribution, and on this map you don't see significant variations. Again, uh, if you think of it, uh, it's also very challenging to really distinguish the two, given that the Y6 with the Lorentzian shape peak here will always have also a residual contribution that is significant in the spectral range of the donor. Such, even if you would do now uh, a single color imaging and you would detect, say, the signal here, any rise in this polymer contribution connected to a decrease of this small molecule contribution, the Y6, will probably cancel out such that you wouldn't expect a significant contrast. So again, in the IR, uh, mapping is, is, is very challenging here. Um, what we do see are variations um, in the nano FTR spectra for samples that have been derived from different solvents. So there's a list of solvents, four different solvents. Uh, they lead to different morphologies and also to different uh, power conversion efficiencies and to some variations in the spectral signatures here on the left side of this peak, here on the right side. Uh, to, to get an understanding and to see if this is, uh, uh, we can understand that in some ways, um, our collaborators here at the LMU Chemistry, they did quantum chemical calculations for different dimer configurations that they assumed or also took from the crystallographic data, showing that indeed, also from a theoretical point of view, we would expect um, variations in these IR spectra for different yeah, local morphologies. So this is compatible with what we see, but we don't see a clear correlation, say, with film morphology, for instance. Okay, um, as I said, in the IR, it's very difficult to distinguish the two because the small molecule signal contribution is always much stronger than the one from the donor, the polymer. On the other hand, of course, if you look into the uh, visible spectrum, you see that they are nicely separated. Um, probing here in the red range, you would primarily see the acceptor, whereas as here in the visible around in the green, you would probably probe the donor. So we set out doing um, monochromatic imaging in the visible, now in a slightly different sample, different uh, acronyms here, uh, to see if there's a, a spatial contrast. And uh, what we get now, again, these are PS head images recorded at 880, that's the acceptor. Uh, you see here the topography scale by 100 nanometer, you see small topographic variations on the order of few nanometers. And if we now look at the phase image, so the absorption image detected at uh, the fourth harmonic, you see that uh, it's structured. And in fact, the features that you see are replicating more or less the topography. So of course, every uh, uh, SNOM experimentalist is allergic uh, if uh, uh, one sees a, a, an image that is too closely connected to topography. We're always suspecting there's some topographic artifact, which is the nightmare. So in order to understand that and, and see if it's real or it could be real or not, we looked at the other orders. So what you would expect seeing is that if you decrease the, the modulation order, uh, you would expect lower spatial resolution, and indeed this is what we find. So if you go to three omega, things become more uh, uh, spread out and even more blurry now if you go to two omega. So we are still not super confident that this is a real material-specific contrast, but at least it would be compatible with the notion that the spatial resolution decreases with the order of the harmonic that you demodulate. So what we see would be compatible with this very uh, simplified sketch for the morphology. The red part would be the small molecule, the blue would be the polymer, 
The small molecule would have somewhat higher features here. This is what we would primarily see here in the absorption image. The blue would be the donor in between. Now again, if you think of uh, lowering the spatial resolution, things would become blurry and you would see something like that. The clear proof, of course, would be to go here into the visible and see the complementary contrast uh, of the donor absorption. Okay, this is what we did next, or at least we tried to. Uh, so this is what you have here. That's the topography, two by two micron. That's the phase image that we detect at 532. This image is rather noisy. The reason is we had to reduce the laser power and we will see in a second why. So there's some spatial contrast and indeed if we go to 880 again, the contrast is different. No. It's not really complementary, but there seems to be some difference. On the other hand, we need to be very careful because if you look at the uh, topography image that we measured at the same time, you see it's the same area. But now in the second scan that we took now with 880 excitation, you see these individual peaks coming up. So these are topographic variations, morphology changes that are induced by the illumination at 532. So in other words, if we try to do the experiment in the visible, we already reduce the laser power as much as possible, you start to modify your sample, okay? And any result that you get afterwards is of course, uh, yeah, uh, has to be taken with some care. So we can also do nano FTR, the spectra look a bit messy. The black would be before, that would be the signature of this IT4F uh, small molecule. After illumination with the green, these peaks disappear and we definitely modify the sample. You can even see that in the microscope image in your NEA spec uh, as an area that has lost its deep blue color. Okay. So that didn't really work. And this is where we are at this stage. So we're trying to uh, lower the laser power even further to get uh, reliable data on that. And uh, I see the chairman, which is great because now I'm already at my summary. Um, I presented work on non-fullerene except the solar cells. <clears throat> we see both components that we have in the cell uh, in their nano-FTR signatures. It, the spectra are dominated by the acceptor, so it's very difficult to distinguish the two spatially. Uh, this is what I sketched again here. There were some differences for films derived from different solvents, something we want to follow up. We did then PS head imaging. We saw contrast that suggested uh, this simplified sketch for the morphology, which we still have to, to prove, of course. Uh, when we tried to do the same experiment at 532 for the donor, it photo bleached, okay. Um, with this, I acknowledge support by and help by the people who did the experiments, Rashid Husaini, who is here, and also Hari Shankar Balakrishnan, who is also here in the audience. Uh, people from LMU and uh, TU uh, uh, chemistry that provided samples and quantum chemical calculations. And of course, NEA spec, especially Nikolai Hartmann for the great support. Thank you.